In the spring of my sophomore year in high school, we had a new sport that was available for us to play. It was not sanctioned by the state yet. It was just a club. So the coach volunteered. We had to buy our own uniforms, which were just t-shirts. Uh, we had to pay so that the varsity team could have referees. The varsity players refereed the JV games, and we got going with boys' volleyball. Now, the girls' volleyball players had been playing volleyball since they were young. All of us were new to it, so if you went to one and saw the girls play and then went and watched us play, they were two very different things. Uh, volleyball kind of has a progression, right? So the one team serves it over the net, and the idea is that the receiving team passes it or bumps it to the setter. The setter is typically standing at the net, and then overhand like this sets it up for somebody to hit it, right, hopefully hard, down to the floor for a point. And so you get three hits on your side, right? So if it's working well, and if you went and watched our girls' team play, the ball came over, they'd pass it, set it, spike it. Maybe the other team would dig it back up and try to do the same thing coming back. Then if you came and watched us play, I was the setter, so I stood at the net, and sometimes the ball got there, but often I was running around trying to get it so that it was not unusual for our third hit not to be a hit up at the net, but somebody just doing this from wherever they were. Now, that's not always the most accurate way to get the ball over the net. So our coach would stand on the sideline, and he said the same thing every time. When we were getting to that third hit that wasn't set up at the net, he would stand on the side and he'd say, stand on the floor and hit the ball, which meant instead of doing this, like square yourself up, good form, and then as the ball comes, hit it like this so that there's a little bit of a line drive to it, you have better control of it. That was the idea. Now, for three years, he told us that. I don't remember if any of us ever did it. Now, I don't know why, because he was eventually inducted into the Hall of Fame in Missouri for being like a Hall of Fame volleyball coach. So he clearly knew what he was talking about. He was there to coach us and teach us on something that he knew how to do. He just couldn't always get us to do that. If you went to the girls' game, they knew how to do that, and they did it all the time, right? But we didn't. Jesus comes into the world, God among us, in part, I think, to show us what it really looks like to be a human being, right? He was fully God, but fully human being. And so when you pay attention to the things that Jesus said and did, a lot of it was an invitation into being fully human. So on Monday, Thursday, we wash feet. And Jesus says in the 13th chapter of John, uh, I'm showing you how to do this so that you can love and serve one another. We see Jesus respond to people who are sick or possessed by demons with mercy. It's him showing us how to have mercy for other people. We see him have compassion for others, and it's an invitation for us to have compassion so that if we pay attention to and follow Jesus, it really is him showing us a way to be human that is in many ways a contrast to the ways that we as a world often try to be human. I think uh, much of our human existence for all of human time has been one where we think there's a scarcity, and from that scarcity, we feel like we have to compete. And whether that's a competition for food, a competition for land, a competition for profits, you can look at the human history and see wars and businesses fighting and people fighting, competition for relationships, all manner of things, and that ends up putting us in places where we're often at odds with each other, trying to protect what is ours, drawing boundaries, and whether those are national boundaries or fences around our yards or walls around our cities, whatever it is, humans have often been at discord. Now it feels like it's worse than it's ever been, but I don't think it's worse than it's ever been. I think it's the same as it's always been. We just have more news cameras to show us where it is, right? So Jesus comes into the world and says, you know, there's a different way. You can live at peace as God intends. You can love and serve one another. You can sacrifice for one another, and maybe the result will be different. The text that we have today, Jesus says all of this kind of hard-to-track stuff sometimes about God, I am in you, and you are in me, and they are in us, and may they be one as we are one. And in all of that talk of this unity, Jesus gives us a reason why 
that unity is important. In the 13th chapter of John, which we heard a few weeks ago, Jesus says, it's by your love of one another that people will know that you are my disciples. So if the church has love for one another, people will go, oh, those are the people that follow Jesus. In the 17th chapter, as he's continuing to pray to God, he says something different. He says, Father, may they all be one so that the world may know you have sent me. Twice he says that. So it's important, right? This is the reason why unity is a thing for the church is because then the world will know that you have sent me. And then when we get later in the passage, Jesus says, the world does not know you. So if I back up to volleyball, if we didn't believe that our coach knew better than us, why would we ever try to stand on the floor and hit the ball? Now, we did believe him. I just don't know why we didn't do it. But if Jesus came to show us a different way of being human, but people don't know who God is and don't believe that Jesus was sent by God, why would we try that different way of being human? So then, Jesus' prayer is that we, as the church, will be one, and if we are one, the world will then go, huh, maybe there's something to that Jesus guy and the way that he's inviting us to live. The problem is, we're not very good collectively as the broader church, at being one. Even in the New Testament, if you read the letters, they already were fighting within them, right? Often Paul's letters are saying, basically, knock it off and right, live into that unity of oneness as the church. So then I get around to trying to figure out how we're supposed to do this, and I immediately run into a block. And that block is, I don't want to be one with the whole church. I don't want to be one with a church that doesn't value women in leadership. I don't want to be one with a church that doesn't do its best to protect women and children from abusers. I don't want to be one with a church that excludes people from the communion table for whatever reason they are excluded. I don't want to be one with a church that uses its uh, theology to try to make its theology the land the law of the land, even when I think that theology isn't exactly what the gospel calls us to. I do not be want, want to be one with the church, with those who, in one hand, hold up the Bible, and in the other hand, hold up an assault rifle and say that Jesus is about guns and violence. I don't want to be one with any of that. And yet, Jesus is praying that those who follow Jesus may be one, and that through the word of those who follow Jesus, others will hear that, and become part of that oneness. So if Jesus is praying this, and I can't even get my mind around being one with the parts of the church that live into the gospel very differently, what do we do? And I honestly think people who lead with hate and think the gospel justifies that, I'm not sure we are supposed to be one with that ideology, right? But how do we be one as the church? And every time I try to think of that, I don't get very far. And that's just me, right? If I can't get past not wanting to be one with the church, and if I can't hear Jesus' prayer about the unity of the church, where are we going to go? Ultimately, I think we end up at the cross. I think at the cross, all of the scarcity mindset that we have as people, all of the fighting that we have to do about everything we fight about, all the competing that we do as human beings, all of that meets Jesus at the cross. And then in the resurrection, we get the gift of new life, and that new life is an invitation to stand on the floor and hit the ball, right? To follow Jesus into this other way of being human. So if I keep getting stuck, what's the next step? Well, first, I really do believe when we speak things out loud enough, it's part of coming to believe. In a little while, we're going to say the creed. And when we get to the third article of the creed, we're going to say that we believe in one... Holy, Catholic, and Apostolic Church. So we're going to say out loud that we believe in the unity of the church. Whether or not I want the unity of the church is a different question. Whether or not I can get there is a different question. But we're going to say we believe it. Holy. One, holy. Holy means set apart. Catholic means universal, right? That's another part of unity. Apostolic means we continue to carry on the gospel message of the apostles. 
So we're going to say out loud, we believe that there is a one holy Catholic apostolic church. Whether or not we make that happen very well is a different question. So that's where we start, by articulating what we believe. The next thing I think we can do is live into the gifts that the Spirit is already stirring up among us to make that unity happen. Because we do not manufacture the unity. It is a gift that Jesus gives us. It is the prayer that Jesus prays. We get to experience it as it happens. Several, several years ago, we had a conversation. Well, so let me say, while I can't get my mind around the unity of the whole church, I can get my mind around the unity of a congregation, right? Because we have to start somewhere. And in this place, we have a wide variety of beliefs. We have Republicans, and we have Democrats, and we have Independents, and we have people that think all of the politics is a complete joke and that they're not going to participate. We got the whole, right, all of that. And yet, we're all here. We have theologies that are lifelong Lutheran, pretty standard ideas and understandings of God, and we have whole different other things. But we're all here. And quite a few years ago, we had a conversation about what our values are. And one of those values we said was that all are welcome. And we had a conversation about it. And we said, what does all mean? And we said, well, all means all. And we said, well, what if those people don't worship like us or act like us or speak the same language as us or have the same understanding of human sexuality as us? Are they still welcome? And we said, well, if all people are welcome into the gospel, then all must mean all. So we came to a point of unity. Not agreeing on everything, not always in the same place, but a unity around saying, yes, we value that. A couple years later, we had some more conversation that said, you know, lots of churches say all people are welcome, but then people show up and find out that they're not. And so you have to be more specific and say, when we say all are welcome, we really do mean all people. By that, we mean whatever your ethnicity, whatever it is you came from, whatever language, whatever your ability or disability, whatever... However, all those things, your gender identity, your gender expression, we put together a whole welcome statement that's on our website. Are we all in 100% agreement about all that? Nope. Do we have some unity that got us to that place? We do. And what I can tell you that you don't all get to see all the time is that that matters hugely. Because you don't get to see always the people who show up here who have not been welcome in other places who have experienced the church that I don't want to be one with, but then they come to this place where we've got at least some unity around that welcome, and they find that it's a safe space. And when it happens, it is such a sacred moment to be the church that can welcome people who have not been loved by the church, and to be that space where they can grieve or get married or find love or forgiveness, whatever it is that they did not experience in other places. And then when you read this text, you go, yes, if we are one, then our word goes out into the world and other people experience that love of God. And that grows out of the unity that we have that shows us there's a different way to live than the ways that the world is always calling us to. This happened again during the pandemic. Very early on when we had to decide what are we going to do? The first thing we did, read the gospel. And say, what does the gospel call us to do? It calls us to love and care for our neighbor. The gospel calls us to look out for people that are the most vulnerable. And so all along, as we've made decisions about protocols and online worship and all the rest of that, have we had a big church fight about that? We have not. Have we all been in agreement about all the steps along the way? No. Have other churches been torn apart by masks and this and that? Yes, right? There's a unity there. And where did that unity come from? It came from the gospel. It came from starting in that place. So that we already have this gift. We as a denomination have common communion agreements with Episcopalians and Methodists and some Presbyterians. And those common communion agreements mean that we believe that we share enough that we can have pastors preaching in each other's congregations and presiding at the table. Do we agree on all of our understanding of those things? No, but after 500 years of fighting about it, we finally got around and saying, we don't have to agree to gather around the table together, do we? And we said, no, we could probably do that, right? That's a gift of unity. So while I can't get my mind around unity with the parts of the church I don't want to be unified with, 
I see all around us all the time the gift of unity in this place that is a gift not for us just to keep but to share. But we're not done yet because part of that unity means we have to have hard conversations. Those were not easy conversations from the beginning to talk about our values and to figure out what it means that all people are welcome. They were not easy conversations that we had about our protocols and how we're going to deal with the pandemic. And now we have more conversations to have. Looking around this room right now, there are two, maybe three of us that have been through a school lockdown drill. And I know they've been through school lockdown drills. My kids have been on school lockdown multiple times. I did not grow up with that. Most of you did not grow up with that. Are we allowed to talk about that? Or are we going to not talk about that? I got an email from one of our younger adults this week that was just the pouring out of their heart and their pain over what happened in Texas with the shooting. It ended by saying, I'm sure you've gotten a lot of emails about this this week. I got one. If we're not going to talk about hard stuff, if we're not going to talk about stuff that matters, why would anybody want to be a part of what we have going on? The world does that all the time. Jesus invites us into a different place. It is a place of unity, but we don't get to that unity easily. We get to it by going through the cross into the places of new life. And that means we have to have hard conversations. But we can do that because God gives us this gift of love and grace that we share together. We've already done it. We've done it lots of ways. It's just a matter of continuing to do it with the things that we've been afraid to talk about. But in that, we will discover that Jesus is already there, that the Holy Spirit has already invited us into this place of unity, and that when we do that, what will happen is what has already happened, and that's that the Holy Spirit will work through us to make safe space for people and to invite them into God's love. A couple of years after uh, our team completely failed at standing on the floor and hitting the ball, I found myself playing intramural volleyball with a bunch of people who had never played volleyball, so I got nominated sort of the player coach. And we weren't any kind of good at volleyball together, so there was a lot of this going on. And I was standing on the sidelines, and what do you suppose I said? Stand on the floor and hit the ball! And then I went on the court, and you know what I could do all of a sudden? Stand on the floor and hit the ball. Could the rest of my teammates do it? No, but they were just getting started. And this is how I think it works in the church. We say we believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We may not always get it right. We may not want the church to be one. But after we say it, we start to practice it. And we get it right sometimes because God is at work in us. And the more we get it right, the more we find our ability to do it. And then we share it with the rest of the world. And then more people get invited into it. And pretty soon, this invitation that Jesus has for us to live in a different way sticks. And when it sticks, people know that they are loved by God. And then they, too, can share this gift that we've already been given. Amen.